So, a while back, I received a strange delivery. An envelope addressed to my internet name containing a letter and a flash drive. The letter was from someone calling themselves simply the CEO of SCOB. They stated that my family was put under house arrest at a place called SCOB HQ in Taiwan. The flash drive supposedly contained the game I had to beat in order to free them. I'm Zetetic, and I'm here to talk to you about my journey into Fire Emblem The Reincarnation of Light and Dark for the Game Boy Color. Of course, it concerned me that some mysterious CEO had kidnapped my family, and I was surprised that a CEO of what was probably a respected multinational corporation would stoop so low as to kidnap innocent people. After calling the local police and learning that they don't have jurisdiction in Taiwan, I decided to do some of my own detective work on SCOB. According to uh, Wikipedia, SCOB is a Taiwanese company that made games such as Pokemon Stadium uh, for the Sega Genesis, Final Fantasy X for the Game Boy Color, and Pocket Monsters Crystal. I enjoyed Pokemon Stadium, Final Fantasy X, and Pokemon Crystal as a kid, and I was crushed that the company that made all those games would kidnap my family, but who was this shadowy organization and why, why did they hold such power? According to my thorough research, prior to Taiwan's induction into the World Trade Organization in 2002, well, kind of, it had to use a loophole of sorts to get through China's One China policy, it had laws on the books allowing those with, um, shall we say, sufficient entrepreneurial spirit to make re-releases for media that didn't release in Taiwan within 30 days of its release elsewhere. So, for example, games that were released in Japan on, say, September 1, 1999 for the Super Nintendo, instead of the Nintendo 64 for some reason, were fair game for reproduction in Taiwan by the time October 1, 1999 rolled around, and it was likely sometime in 2000 or 2001 that SCOB released their version of Fire Emblem for the Game Boy Color, which itself was the newest Nintendo handheld console at the time. At the very latest, it had to have been before 2002, as Taiwan was obligated to change its laws by January 1st of that year, uh, likely as a condition for being accepted into the World Trade Organization, which kind of has a thing for intellectual property, to say the least. So with all that out of the way, I plugged Scob's flash drive into my computer, scanned the flash drive for suspicious files, and opened the most suspicious file of them all, the Game Boy Color ROM. Not gonna lie, the opening cutscene is pretty impressive, artistically speaking. You can tell Scob knew you only get one chance to make a good first impression. They wanted the player to realize, well, no, to be certain of the fact that this was a real game with heart and effort put into it. They knew a lot of people would dismiss this game as a reproduced bootleg and wanted to get in front of that story before anyone else could. Heck, a lot of people tried to convince me that this was a bootleg, but I'm pretty sure it's a legitimate Fire Emblem game since it has Fire Emblem characters in it and says Fire Emblem on the title screen. In fact, this is what the title screen looks like. Isn't that amazing? The flashing words on the bottom really drives home the fact that this is a Fire Emblem game. Load game is an option even if you don't have anything saved yet. At least starting a new game is easy. Honestly, the game has an incredible visual appeal to it considering the time. They definitely did not waste the potential of the Game Boy Color by only using graphics from old Super Nintendo games. In fact, the tile sets seem to be a mix of Fire Emblem Gaiden and an older version of RPG Maker 2000's default RTP. The characters' faces are colored differently to be original. For example, take a look at Ethlyn's Braveheart paint. Great choice for a fragile healer. The battle animations come from Gaiden. Leaf has Alms animation, which is pretty neat. The sprites for the characters on the map come from Gaiden too, so it makes sense that this game was sometimes called Fire Emblem Gaiden. After all, it uses so many of Gaiden's assets. And the music is lovely. Sure, there's like five different tracks in total probably, but they're all great and don't get repetitive at all after a few minutes of listening to them. There have been other Fire Emblem games with even less variety, so I can't really complain here. It's interesting to see where different characters from Genealogy of the Holy War and Thracia 776 appear. Like, Dadgar retired and became a generic villager in this game. Good for him. He deserves some rest after everything he's been through. Characters from both generations of Genealogy and Thracia 776 are in the party at the same time somehow, and I for one was surprised to learn that Scob did time travel way before the writing teams for Awakening and Fates expertly weaved time travel into their stories. Other odd characters show up here and there as boss enemies, though I won't spoil those surprises too much. It suffices to say that I was shocked at a few betrayals in particular. The game continues to show promise in its gameplay direction. Before I go further, you have to bear in mind that, as far as I could tell, most of Scob's games are, well, side-scrolling action fighters with a popular theme. Think Contra or Streets of Rage, but Pokemon or Final Fantasy themed. The game stands out in that it not only holds the Fire Emblem name, but actually plays kind of like a Fire Emblem game. That said, there are two things in this game that aren't in any other Fire Emblem game that I want to talk about. The first one, and probably the more obvious one at the very start, is that each character has a list of usable skills. Although Alec is the only character with a starting skill in Chapter 1, 
All of your characters will receive skills as they level up, and you'll eventually get more characters that start with their own skills. Basically, the way skills work is you spend SP, presumably this stands for skill points, on using a skill anytime you want. Want Alec to double attack? Spend his SP and have him use Pursuit. Want to multiply Karen's experience for a round of combat? Spend SP on the Elite skill, and so on and so forth. SP restores at a rate of 1 point per turn, so you're not entirely out of luck once you run out. And honestly, I was surprised at this very odd but very early implementation of what are essentially combat arts, mostly because it's such a simple and generic system that you'd find in plenty of RPGs and yet won't completely find in Fire Emblem games. Yeah, you can spend HP and Gaiden slash Echoes and weapon durability in three houses, and arguably those systems have more tactical heft since, well, you're putting your character at risk of dying or uh, breaking their weapon earlier, I guess, but in Scob Fire Emblem, you could theoretically just skip a return a few times to regain lost SP. That would, that would be cheesy, though. So in a way, the system relies on the assumption that you're going to try to play at least somewhat efficiently. That being said, you could definitely design a Fire Emblem game around this SP system if you use reasonable methods to discourage turtling and idling on the map, or encourage somewhat efficient gameplay in the way Fire Emblem already does that, by including optional timed objectives like reaching treasure or a village before the enemy does. Scob doesn't actually do that, but I'm sure they could have if they wanted to. The other thing that sticks out is the leveling system. Scob Fire Emblem says heck no to growth rates. Too random, too obfuscated. Instead, when your character levels up, you get 4 attribute points to distribute among your character's 7 stats. HP, you know what this is. SP, the skill points we talked about earlier. Strength, or more accurately, power, since it increases the might of physical and magical attacks and the power of healing magic. Defense, decreases physical damage. Resistance, decreases magical damage. Skill, increases your chances to hit. And speed, increases your chances to avoid attacks. There isn't luck in this game because, uh, I guess because there aren't critical hits, but that's besides the point. You can choose the stats you get. And for a series that has put an increasing amount of emphasis on character customization over the years, to the point that customization has the potential to break their game, it's mildly strange that it not only still uses a chance-based growth rate system, but attempts to hide that system by not showing the player those growth rates. Yeah, all those growth rates you take for granted on Fire Emblem Wiki or Walkthrough or, or whatnot are data mined. I'm glad Scob pushed back against this silly way to design a game, something Fire Emblem fans have come to accept over the years, but really is completely unintuitive when looking in from the outside. Of course, a system like this can only work when each attribute has an equal value, which I'm glad to say that they do. Take speed and strength, for example. Getting a 1% extra chance to dodge an attack that has a 163% chance to hit is perfectly equivalent to doing an extra point of damage per attack, which compounds itself with skills like Pursuit, Continue, or Triple. The skill mages get to cast their magic three times, but actually triggers four times for reasons. More on that later. This system would work just fine in other Fire Emblem games with no adjustment whatsoever. There's no need to make better attributes cost more than less good attributes, or to give different characters more or fewer attribute points per level based on their archetype. It's a perfect system as is, and works perfectly in this perfect, perfect game. The map design widely varies between clearly inspired by a previous Fire Emblem game to incredibly large and winding to make the chapter take longer, with a lot of in-between. Since most maps require you to visit an enemy castle with Leaf, and Leaf is locked to 4 movement prior to promotion, and only gets 5 movement on promotion, the big maps present the challenge of, well, walking Leaf over to the objective at the same rate of the game's armor knights and generals, which is incredibly difficult, and I applaud Scob for introducing the mechanic of a slow lord to the series since this was clearly influenced by characters like Sigurd and Marth. Then there are ambush spawns. Let's talk about ambush spawns for a moment in this game. They appear out of thin air, often right in front of your units, and personally I think that's wonderful. It's a challenge to move slowly through the map with Leaf, only to discover that Leaf tripped a wire which caused a Devil Axe Warrior to come out and hit him for 67 damage, instantly ending your attempts at the chapter. It's great to fly over a river with Karen and Lachesis, who's a Pegasus Knight in this game by the way, to discover a cabal of Dark Mages have appeared next to them. Flawless video game with no flaws whatsoever. Oh, and this game is locked to casual mode, which is convenient as it saves time that you'd otherwise use up having to choose between classic or casual mode at the start of a new game. When your unit is reduced to 0 HP, they retreat until the start of the next chapter. This isn't at all a misunderstanding of what Fire Emblem is about as a series, but rather a convenient mechanic for a player playing a video game on the go. Scob knew their game would be incredibly difficult, especially with the challenging ambush spawns that appear, so they wanted to give the player a chance at completing their game without softlocking themselves. 
Of course, if Leaf dies, you get a game over, but this is somewhat mitigated by mid-chapter saving, which also exists in this game. And you can save any time during player phase, including after you've moved some units. But you only get one save slot for this. Then there's a bunch of minor blessings to count. The user interface is incredibly well streamlined. You can't check what weapons the enemy has, and you can't see what items your characters are holding if they move that turn. Giving the players fewer options to gather information allows them to play the game blindly and recklessly instead of taking the time to strategize, which is really a waste of time in Fire Emblem if you think about it. Trading is only one way, one item at a time, and ends your action once complete, so you can't pull off lame strategies that rely on trading like you can in other Fire Emblem games. When attacking with magic, you see the enemy's physical defense in the battle forecast instead of their resistance, although resistance is factored into the damage and not defense. This is a trick, intended to scare the player into thinking their mage will do no damage to a scary general, and to discourage mage on general violence. You have the option to visit every tile, but if you visit a non-visitable tile, it's the same as waiting. How convenient. Healing items have exactly one use, so you don't have to worry about dozens of vulnerabilities with only one or two uses left, cluttering the convoy anymore. Trading items around outside of battle involves putting the item in storage with one character and then taking it out with another. A long process, you have to think about deciding whether to bother with it, ensuring most characters' inventories mostly stay the same throughout the game. You can't skip battle animations or turn them off. Actually, there's no options menu at all. This is good, as it allows Scob to ensure that each player gets the exact same experience for every playthrough. And finally, there are several unintended features of the game. Some skills just straight up don't work, or work sometimes but fail other times. Like sometimes you use Adept and it works as expected. Other times, you see the combat animation start up and quickly go away, and you find that nothing happened, you just lost some SP. This is a good way to ensure you can't always rely on your character's skills to get through, and that unpleasant surprises can force you to adapt. Some of your characters get a skill called Javelin to attack at 2 range. Othan gets the Javelin skill too, to throw his axe. And it actually hits twice. The first time when the hand axe passes through the enemy, and the second time when the hand axe comes back through the enemy for Othan to catch. It's as if the damage is tied to animations, like the graphic of the enemy has a hitbox, and the game is relying on the animation to collide with it before calculating the damage, which is totally an efficient way to handle battles that intelligent systems should pick up as soon as possible. Oh wait, they did. I already mentioned triple, a skill mages get to cast their magic three times but actually hits four times, which is great since everyone knows triple actually refers to the number four and not three. Let's talk about experience. The experience you get from killing an enemy is shown in the enemy stats screen, though it assumes your character's level isn't too different from the enemy's. From what I can tell, you get less experience if you're two or more levels higher than the enemy, and it's possible to get no experience for combat sometimes. So let's talk about low-level promoted enemies. Basically, these are enemies that tend to show up in the mid to late game at a lower level than your characters, but promoted. Characters normally promote automatically at level 20, Leaf included, so we're talking about encountering, let's say, a level 14 enemy paladin. These enemies have the stats for a promoted unit, making them harder to fight, even for a unit that has a distinct level advantage over them. But because their level is a smaller number than your unit's level, less or no experience is rewarded at the end of combat. So the most efficient way to face these enemies in terms of experience distribution is to actually chip them down with one of your high level units and then feed the kills to a low level unit. Since the minimum damage dealt is 1, this is theoretically possible. Or you could just kill everything with your overleveled carry like a normal person. For incredibly efficient gameplay, you have two tools at your disposal. The totally intended weapon equip feature and flyers. What is the weapon equip feature you may ask? Well, your units can only initiate attacks on player phase with their class's weapons. Pegasus knights use lances, archers use bows, fighters use axes, you know the deal. But if you give, say, a bow to a Pegasus knight and have her equip it, she will be able to counterattack with it on enemy phase. In the animation, it'll look like she's using a lance, but the attack is still calculated. Why is this such a great feature of the game? Because archers and mages in this game are locked to 2 range, you can clear these enemies out on enemy phase by giving your best unit a powerful 2 range weapon to counter with as they attack you. And flyers are the best units to do this with because they have the highest movement of all characters, 6 before promotion and 7 afterward. And this game eventually gives you 3 of them. Use them well. And circling back to mages being locked out of 1 range attacks, I just want to note that several bosses, including the final boss, are mages. Every unit is a mage killer as long as they can close in. There's not a whole lot I can say about the story besides the fact that it's there. 
It's all in Chinese, which I can't read. I was curious to try and understand bits and pieces of it at least, so I tried using Google Translate on my phone to translate some things, and I think some of the story's finer nuances got lost in translation or something. But the story is there, and at the start and end of each chapter, pretty much everyone on your team has something to say. That's impressive in a way, since in Fire Emblem, a lot of characters get relegated to the background and simply aren't as fleshed out as the main portion of the cast. Like, compare two similar characters in similar positions in the same game, and almost always, the character introduced earlier is the more fleshed out one. Not so with this game, I think. It really focused on giving every character the chance to provide some input, and that makes me really curious to know what they're actually saying. If you think you have the skills to translate the story of this game, and you're as curious as I am, get in contact with me on Discord or Reddit, or email me. Whether you can actually hack a Game Boy Color ROM or can transcribe what's going on. Seriously. Anyway, once I finished the game, the CEO of SCOB contacted me to inform me of a job well done, and that my family would return home shortly. Days passed, then weeks, with no follow-up. So I decided to trace the CEO's call and pay a visit to the SCOB HQ myself. After a calm and reasonable discussion with SCOB's board of directors, I was able to get my family back. No harm done. I mean, except for subjecting myself to Scob Fire Emblem for prolonged periods of time. Seriously though, it brings up some interesting ideas and tries some new things. As it stands now, for Fire Emblem fans, it's a curiosity that's worth checking out. For those interested in designing games like Fire Emblem, whether you're planning on making a ROM hack or using software like SRPG Studio, or doing something else entirely, it's useful for learning some strategy RPG design ideas to adjust so that they work better and feel more well thought out. If you feel like you've learned everything that you can about strategy RPG design from other Fire Emblem games, and you haven't seen this one, I think it's worth checking out at least. Anywho, that's the end of my review. If you enjoyed this review as much as I enjoyed making it, consider leaving a like and subscribing to my channel. I always have some kind of series going on, I usually do weird challenge runs and check out ROM hacks, though at some point I'm thinking of playing Tearing Saga Blind soon too. I have a complete 20 part Let's Play series of this game on my channel if you're feeling brave enough to watch all of it. If not, I recommend at least checking out the first episode for my first impressions of the game, going into it mostly blind. Thank you for watching, and have a good one.